About two weeks ago, I had posted on the community tab a poll asking people to vote on what topic they want me to discuss in this video. And the most popular choice was a look at a PhD probability theory qualifying exam. So I printed out the most recent one, August 2021. And the reason that this is two years old almost now is because this class runs once every two years. So the test is offered once every two years, provided that, you know, you pass it. If you fail it, then I think they give you another chance to take it. But I don't know anyone that really fails these exams because looking at these exams, these tests aren't really that hard. And you're going to see why in a second. Now, the reason that this video took so long to come out <laughs> is because immediately after I posted the poll, I went on vacation. And the vacation lasted about 10 days or so. I posted a picture on the community tab. And I finally got back a few days ago. I'm not actually at my place, which is why the setup here looks different. But um, I was able to get to a printer and print out this most recent qualifier. So I decided to make the video today, because why not? I'm not doing anything right now except preparing for qualifiers. So let's look at the following problems. I'll let you read the statement up here, but let's get to the actual problems. Problem one is worth 14 points. Part A, define convergence and distribution, probability in L1, almost surely, and uniform integrability. Discuss the relations between these types of convergence. How does uniform integrability fit in the discussion? So already, you can see the difference between this exam and the analysis qualifier. Because the first problem is just define what these words mean. And the analysis qualifier is you pretty much have to come in prepared with definitions in hand because they're just going to make you start applying definitions. They're not going to ask you to define the thing. They're going to ask you to apply the definition. But one thing I don't like in part A is where it says discuss the relations between the types because that could mean a number of different things. What exactly do they mean by discuss? Like, are they saying, if you have convergence in L1, do you necessarily have convergence in probability, or why not? I think that's what they're trying to get for, because they're different types of convergence. But I don't think uh, they're really looking for that much. I think they are asking you to say, okay, when do you have one and when do you not have the others? How does uniform integrability fit in this? I know that there are a few theorems that relate you know, under certain con uh, conditions, convergence and probability implies uniform integrability and vice versa, so they might be looking for something like that. I'm not entirely sure. And then part B says, give a simple example of a sequence of random variables on a probability space that converge to zero almost surely, but the sequence fails to converge in L1. So this is like a standard exercise that I do when I prepare for my analysis qual. So a simple example would be something like omega is the interval 0 to 1, f is the Borel sigma algebra, and p is the Lebesgue measure. So you can define xn to be equal to n on the interval from 0 to 1 over n and then 0 everywhere else because then the integral over xn over the space omega is always equal to 1. So it cannot converge to zero in L1, but it does converge to zero almost surely. Although, if you take a closer look at the problem, now that I'm thinking about it, it says the sequence fails to converge in L1. So what I'm thinking here is that it does converge to one in L1, but it doesn't converge to zero in L1. So maybe they're asking for something more. In which case you could, uh, what could you do? Uh, you could you could fix that pretty easily now I'm thinking about it. Like maybe have it equal zero every other n so that it, you know, bounces back and forth between zero and one all the time. But it would still converge to zero almost surely. I think, I think that might fix it. I don't know. This is just me thinking out loud though. Okay, problem two. 
15 points. Define what it means to say omega fp is a probability space. Okay, so already they're asking for more definitions. State all the requirements for each of the three objects in the triple. Give an example of such a triple. Okay, so omega is just basically a set. In fact, you might... Normally we let it be non-empty, so I would say it's a non-empty set. And then f is a sigma algebra, so it has to satisfy the three requirements of a sigma algebra. It has to be... The empty set has to be in there. It has to be closed under complementation. It has to be closed under intersections, unions. That's st that type of stuff. And then p is a measure, so... I mean, I don't know how many times I've written down the definition of measure at this point. It's it's a lot. State all the requirements of each of the three triples. Give an example. Okay, so the example I gave in the last the last problem would probably be sufficient. Define what it means to say that X is... Although it does say probability space, so you have to include the requirement that P of omega is equal to 1. Because that would be a probability space. Define what it means to say x is a real-valued random variable defined over a probability space. Give an example of such a real-valued random variable. So a random variable has to be finite almost everywhere, or almost surely in probability theory language. And it has to be extended real-valued and measurable. It has to be a measurable function. Uh, give an example of such a real-valued random variable. I mean, <laughs> x equals 0 everywhere is kind of a the most trivial example I can think of. Maybe they're looking for something more. In which case, you could say maybe, like, if you wanted to get fancy, I guess you could say the Dirichlet function. Define what it means to say ft is a cumulative distribution function of a random variable x defined over a ran uh, probability space, give an example. So, I mean, really, this, this problem is kind of free 15 points. Because everything here is just basic definitions. There, uh, the, the, the qualifying exam for real analysis would be, say, okay, you have to know all this frontwards and backwards, and then you have to actually apply it. Here, they're just checking to make sure that you read the notes. So, a cumulative distribution function is like, the probability of all the points in omega such that x of omega is less than or equal to t. And then t, and there's also some prop of, there's, there's more to it than that though. So it has to be right continuous, I believe, and it has to, the limit has to equal zero as t tends toward negative infinity and equal to one when t tends toward positive infinity. I also believe it has to be non-decreasing. So it always gets bigger. So, something like that. So, already, I haven't studied for this test, by the way, <laughs> at all, and I've already had the first two problems, I think. So, what's problem three? Maybe this is where I start screwing up. If the probability of a n tends to zero, and the sum of probability of a n complement intersect a n plus one is finite, then prove that the probability of a n infinitely often is equal to zero. So I believe they've just creatively rewritten the borel cantelli lemma, which is my favorite lemma, my favorite theorem, so I'm pretty sure I can, I can prove this. Find an example of a sequence an to which the result in one can be applied, but the, oh, never mind, I lied to myself, but the borel cantelli lemma cannot. So when can the borel cantelli lemma not be applied? I believe that the measure space in and of itself has to be finite that you're on. But in problem one, they never really say that the probability space is finite. So there's some extra things going on here. So the probability of an has to tend to zero. So an has to get pretty small. And then a and complement intersect the next one has to be finite. Hmm. I have to think about it for a second. I mean, to be honest though, I mean, what if you just chose a n to be zero, like the measure of a n to be zero every time?
What does the Boro Cantelli lemma say? <laughs> My favorite lemma. You have to have a finite measure space, and you have to assume that the sum of probabilities of a sequence of sets converges. And then the probability of lim soup has to tend to zero. I have to play with it a little bit, but it doesn't look too bad. What does problem four say? Use the Kolmogorov three series theorem to prove that if xn is an iid sequence of random variables taking values one and negative one with equal probability, and if an is a sequence of real numbers, then the sum of a and xn converges almost surely if and only if the sum of a n squared converges. Okay, so now we've actually started to get into some real problems. I still don't think this problem is hard. It's just I've forgotten what the Kolmogorov three series theorem says. So this is where I'd have to actually start studying. But you can look at the problem here and try it for yourself. I don't think it's too bad. I guess I'll make a few comments before I move on. Uh, so IID sequence of random variables, what that means is that they are independent and identically distributed. So independence is a probability concept. It means that, uh, come on brain, don't fail me now. The probability of the intersection of two sets is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, I think. I think that's what that means. Man, I'm terrible. I haven't looked at my probability in forever. But identically distributed means they all have the same distribution function. I know what that means. So they take 1 and negative 1 with equal probability, so... The probability of you getting one is like, it's like flipping a coin, right? You flip heads, you get, it's a half prob. The probability is one half. If you flip tails, the probability is also one half. And if a sequence of real numbers is given, then we know that this converges almost surely, if and only if this sum converges. Hmm. Yeah, I have to look up the theory series, the three series. Theorem. I don't remember what it says. Okay, so we have problem five, which is worth 14 points. I guess we get that for free. <laughs> and then problem six. I know what it really says. If xn is a sequence of independent random variables, probability that xn is equal to one is equal to the probability of xn equal to negative one is equal to one fourth, which is less than the probability of xn equal to zero, which is equal to one half. What can you say about the convergence of Sn over the square root of n and y? Okay, they've made a typo because they've never defined Sn. I'm pretty sure under this context, Sn is the sum of the first n random variables. Usually that's how it's written in a lot of these tests. But this problem also is not very difficult. It's just you have to, um, oh, I think uh, maybe the central limit theorem comes into play here. Although we don't have IID, in which case we would have to use a different central limit theorem. Or maybe I'm just completely wrong. Maybe I have to review my notes. Because I don't think this problem is hard. I'm saying that a lot. <laughs> These problems aren't hard. It's just I don't remember how to solve them. <laughs> It's been, it's been a few weeks since I studied probability theory, and I've been kind of switched over to real analysis mode. Okay, next problem. Let x1, x2, yada, 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 be independent random variables. The expectation of xi is equal to mu i, not equal to zero. Expectation of the, or excuse me, I should say finite first moment of xi is finite. Let Sn be the sum of the first n random variables. Sn hat, I think that's a hat. Yeah. Of the sum of xi minus mu i. Okay. S0 equals S hat 0 equals 0. Sigma algebra generated by the first n random variables. Prove that Sn is not a martingale, but Sn bar is a martingale. Okay. So we just did martingales in class, so I'm pretty sure I could do this. 
I mean, you're told you have finite first moment. Uh, we have a good sigma algebra here. So the next random variable, or each random variable is this much measurable, so that should be fine. So it's really that third property of martingales that you have to check. So I don't think A is that hard. I'm pretty sure I could do it. Assume now that x1, x2, yada, yada, are iid. Then the expectation of xk sn is equal to sn over n almost surely for k equal 1 through n. So I guess that's what we have to prove. I don't think that's too difficult here. Because when they write sn here, we're saying that xk is this much measurable. So it's the sigma algebra generated by sn, where sn is this sum. So it's the sigma algebra, sigma algebra generated by that sum. I don't think this is too bad. I think 7 here is not, not hard. If given enough time, I could do it today, probably. All right, so, and the reason for this is because we just covered martingales and Brownian motion, you know, before I went on vacation, so this stuff's pretty fresh for me. Let BT, FT, T between 0 and infinity is a Brownian motion starting at 0, probability space. Define MT be the X, uh, E raised to this power. What can you say about MT and the expectation of MT? Prove your assertion. Okay, so this, I believe, is the walled martingale construction from the notes. I know where to look in order to solve this problem. I'm trying to remember. I know this function is convex, so I think you can say that it is a sub-martingale. I think this is referring to Jensen's inequality or conditional Jensen's expectation. What can I say about the expectation of MT? I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I really should know this. Uh, define yt to be b squared minus t. Let gt be a filtration, yada, yada, yada. Is the adapted process a martingale on omega fp? Prove your assertion. I believe that it is, and it follows the general walled martingale construction that he showed in his notes that I studied frontwards and backwards, because that's exactly what this looks like. Do I remember how to do it off the top of my head? I know you need to take derivatives and set u equal to zero somewhere. That's that's what I remember from that. But I do need to look over the notes. And that's the last problem. So there were, I think it went up to eight, but we skipped a number. So there's really only like seven problems. Yeah. So there's seven problems in total. Overall, this test is much, 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 much easier than the analysis qual. In fact, I could do one right now. Let me see. Let's see if how many of these I can do. I can do one. I can do two. I'm pretty sure I could do three. Four. I need to look up Kolmogorov's. Five. I think I could get maybe half credit right now. I need to look over my notes. Seven. I can do seven. Eight. If you let me look over my notes a little bit, I can get eight. So already, I'm pretty sure I could pass, but just not very well. But after about a month of preparation, I'm pretty sure I could get an A on these qualifiers. Again, you know, they'll change the problems, obviously, from, from this one to the next one. But I've looked at the previous quals, and they don't really change the problems much, and they all kind of look like this same level difficulty. So, in short, what do I think of these probability theory qualifying exams? I think that they're really easy, all things considered. I mean, I haven't studied at all, and I'm pretty sure I could definitely get half of the points on this test, and if you give me a month to study for the test, I think I could get more than 90%. The analysis qual... <laughs> <laughs> it's way harder. It's uh, It takes me months and months and months just to get a failing grade to, you know, for whatever that means. So basically, I'll make another video and I'll describe what kind of study routine that I've adopted. I know a lot of people ask me, like, questions on the channel of how do I tackle a problem that I'm just getting nowhere with and how what's my schedule look like in terms of how do I manage studying for these classes and I want to make a more detailed video explaining 
those things in detail. So I think that will probably be my next video as soon as I get that all squared away. But I hope you found this video informative. It's been about 20 minutes, usually my go-to runtime. So I'm going to sign off here. Thank you much. Thank you for watching and hope to see you in the next one.